Welcome Stefan Pastis to the Northwest Passages stage. Thank you. So when he came up from the green room, he was dressed like this. So hang on. Now, so thank you for coming. We've really enjoyed having you here. I, I, I was, was, was wanting to talk to you a little bit about your new book, but I think we should wait. Let's begin at the beginning. Very How good. does a lawyer from UCLA who's worked in the Bay Area decide, I would like to draw stick figures for a living? <laughs> so when I, when I was a little kid, um, I saw the comic strip Peanuts. And I fell in love immediately with that world. And I started cartooning from that age on. Um, and I wanted to be a cartoonist one day, but the odds are so against you. I think of the people who submit to syndicates, one in 30,000 make it. So you can't, you can't really count on it as a career plan. Um, so I took a diversion, and I went to law school. Um, and <laughs> I became a lawyer for... 10 years in San Francisco. And if you guys want to start this off with a big boo, I'll give you an opportunity. Um, do you want to know what kind of lawyer I was? I defended big insurance companies. Thank you very much. It deserves that. But here's the good news. So I would draw when I got home at the end of a work day, and I would draw on weekends, and I would sometimes draw in court, um, which was fantastic. Um, until I had 30 of a concept of comic strips, 30 strips centered around some theme. And I would turn those in and to the syndicates, the people who put you into newspapers. And so I submitted one after another, and they all got rejected. And they all had Rat in them. But I think Rat by himself is a little bit uh, overwhelming. <laughs> so when I paired him with Pig, and he had a sweet sort of uh, counterpart, uh, the syndicates immediately liked it. And so then I started just counting down the days until um, I could quit being a lawyer. But here's the little side part that my syndicate for years asked me never to tell. But now I just tell it because the syndicate went defunct, so it's fair. <laughs> Once they had signed me, I was counting down the days till I stopped being a lawyer. I had a little, um, I had matches in a mug on my desk and I lit one every day for a day I had left. And right before I was scheduled to launch, they canceled the whole thing. The sales team canceled it. They said this can never sell the newspapers. You've got two stick figures, they're not well drawn, they never move, and they talk about death half of the time. So I went from escaping to now I was stuck being a lawyer. So the syndicate a couple months later came back and they said, we're gonna experiment with something. Now, this is done all the time now. At the time, it was not done. We will put you on the internet, and we'll see how you do. So they put me on their website, and they just watched the hits. And every day, it got 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, which for them wasn't a lot. And out of nowhere, one day, I got an email from the syndicate saying that Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert, who at the time was the biggest, hottest name in the planet, uh, was going to endorse me. He just had been reading it, and he loved it. And I remember printing that email and showing it to my wife, Stacy, and saying, if I ever make it in this business, this was the moment. And it was the moment, because the next day, I got 157,000 hits from Scott alone. So, <laughs> so, so I was off and running, and it launched a few months later, and I quit being a lawyer, and I've been doing this for the last uh, 22 years. So. Yeah, thank you. So, regardless of what anyone thinks of, of, of Dilbert's creator's politics, he found this guy, so we forgive him a little. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I got to work at the Washington Post for, for several years, and I never knew that making it to the Washington Post as a, as, a, as a comic is a huge deal, and it takes years, 10 years, 20 years. Yeah. Well, did it take 10, 20 years for you? No, this is so crazy. When I launched, there was a comic strip some of you may know that's still around called Get Fuzzy. 
uh, buddy of mine. Thank you. Yeah. And it was so hot, and it was selling everywhere. But like every new strip, it did not sell into the Washington Post. They wait for years. And the import of the Washington Post is all the big national papers, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, New York Times, no comics. But the Post has comics. So you want to get in the Post. So my syndicate had no hope for me. But the editor in charge of comics took to my strip immediately. And she said, we not only want them at the launch, we would like a week only for us. So I debuted in one newspaper, the Washington Post, with a week of dailies that only their readers saw. So I've been in the Post since the very beginning. So that was huge for me. Thank you. I love that. So uh, wh where are you from? I'm from Southern California. So I grew up near Pasadena. Yeah. Uh, and now I'm from Santa. Good, we got Peace Bowl. <laughs> it's a suburb of Los Angeles. And then um, now I live in Santa Rosa, which is about an hour north of San Francisco. So Santa Rosa, uh, another famous uh, new, new comic strip is from there. Uh, this guy. But uh, no one who knows him calls him this. Yes. They all call him that. Correct. So yeah. did you know Sparky? Were you, were you inspired by him? Yes. Tell me about uh, your relationship with, with Sparky. Yes. So Sparky uh, lived in Santa Rosa, California, and a lot of people think I moved there because Sparky lived there. Um, I moved there because Stacy, my wife, her family has lived there for 120 years. So she wanted to live there. But she was so helpful to me in meeting Sparky. She told me that every day he has an uh, English muffin in the cafe in the morning. And if you ever want to meet him, you can meet him. So I took the day off of work, and I drove. I didn't live in Santa Rosa at the time, and I drove to Santa Rosa. Some of you may have heard this story before. But you've got to understand, I got into this because of Schultz. Um, he was everything to me. So I don't know who the famous person is in your lives that you have always wanted to meet but multiply it by 10 and put it all in one person, and that was Sparky for me. So he had an ice arena in Santa Rosa. The cafe was attached to it. And I went up there, and I sat at a table, and I didn't order anything, and I watched the skaters, and nobody showed up. And I thought, oh, darn it, it wasn't right. He doesn't show up every day. So I was ready to leave and go back to my work day as a lawyer. And sure enough, on the far side of the room, this man with this white schlock of hair comes in. And man, I think that's the most nervous I've ever been in my life. And he ordered his English muffin. And he sat there and he read the, Chron the San Francisco Chronicles comic section. And I waited for him to finish the English muffin and finish reading. And I got up the courage. And man, did this take a lot of courage. I crossed the cafe and I walked up to him and I knelt at the side of his table and in the worst opening line you have ever heard, I said, hi, Mr. Schultz, my name is Stefan Pastis, and I'm an attorney. <laughs> Sparky's face, Schultz's face, turned white. He thought he was getting served with a subpoena. So I had to tell him, no, 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 I, I draw. And then Sparky goes, do you have your stuff with you? And I did, it was in the car. And so I go, yeah, I'll get it. And as you're walking to the car, I mean, this is so intimidating. This is like a guy who's played wiffle ball his whole life, meets Ted Williams, and Ted Williams says, how do you swing the bat? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Suddenly, this becomes very real, very fast. And so I showed him my strips, and he gave me all these tips, and he took a photo with me, and it was incredible. Where I draw the photo of me and Sparky, is right there next to me. And, and irony of ironies, after he died, I became the first person to write an animated peanut special without Sparky. The family trusted me to do it. So it was really cool. <laughs> so where he worked, was, his studio was famous, but you can't, ha there's not access to it, or is there access to it? And have you ever been in there? Yeah, so the reason I became a cartoonist, remember I said I read those Peanuts books. I read one specific Peanuts book. It was the 25th anniversary book, 1975. And it had all these photos of his studio, this great studio that had a big pond surrounding it, big sliding glass window, and he stared out there. So all the great Peanuts strips you see, when he was really at his peak, 1965 to 1975, he did in this one little room. But you can't access that room because it's somebody's home now. 
So my wife, Stacy, found the owners and contacted them and told them that I do a comic strip. They happened to know the comic strip, and they said, bring them over. So this was just a few months ago. She gets me in. It looks exactly like it did in the old... I almost cried. Like, it was the full circle. It's why I got into this, and there it was, like, right in front of me. So I just sat there, and I stared out the same window he did while he drew, and it was one of those moments in life where you're like, oh, this is incredible. So, yeah, super cool. <laughs> so I, I, I want to ask about your studio. Is it in your home, or is it someplace else? Where, where do you draw? Yeah, so I, uh, we live in Santa Rosa, but we have a, I have a studio about two miles from where we live. Um, but it's a condo. Um, in really an, uh, an old folks development. <laughs> so I'm the only person there under 75, I think. Um, but they're all super nice, and I love it, and it's quiet. Um, and I go there every day, and I write, and I draw. Um, the thing I've started doing lately, I used to always write upstairs in the condo. Um, I walk and write now. It's fantastic. I carry my iPhone, and I have the little voice memo thing. And I have found if you walk and listen to music, Ideas just come to you. So then I record them, and then I come back and I draw them. So that's my newest routine, but I love it, yeah. So when I was growing up, Calvin and Hobbes was, was it, and then it kind of goes away. And so, but you had a, a relationship at some level with Watterson. Can you explain, and were you able to tell anyone that you had that relationship? For sure. Or are you making this up? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's often the case. So, I assume you all know Calvin and Hobbes, right? Yeah. One of, one of the, so, when I was in high school, Calvin and Hobbes, Bloom County, Farside, those are the big three. Um, but here's the thing about Watterson that some of you may not know. He is our Greta Garbo, J.D. Salinger. You can't meet him. He doesn't come to events. When he won the Rubin for Best Comic, he wasn't there. Um, he is the recluse in what we do. So you will have no contact with him, even if you become syndicated. But I knew that he lived in a suburb of Cleveland. And when I was on a tour through Cleveland, I had a friend named Nick Galifianakis, who's a cartoonist for the Washington Post. He knew Watterson because they were working on a book together. And I said to Nick, I'm coming through Cleveland. Is there any way in the world that Watterson would just have coffee with me? So he asked him, and Watterson said, no. <laughs> <laughs> so you would think that was the end of the story. Uh, but I did the tour, I came back home, and then Nick wrote me and said, did you email him or anything? And I said, no, you said he didn't want to have coffee. And he goes, just email him and tell him how much the strip, mean to you, the strip meant to you. So I said, all right. So I wrote to him. And in a very ballsy maneuver, I included one of my own comics at the top of the email. Now, in the comic strip, I'm separated or divorced. And in the comic strip, I go to a bar, and I'm trying to meet women. And I tell a woman I'm trying to impress that I do a syndicated comic strip. And she says, oh, which one do you do? And I lie and say, Calvin and Hobbes. <laughs> and then we end up in a bed together in the last panel. <laughs> so I, I send that to Watterson. As soon as I click send, I'm thinking, oh, that was a bad move. <laughs> and so I'm just waiting for a response, any response. Whatever Bill sends to me, I'm going to print and I'm going to frame because it's Bill Watterson. And sure enough, shortly thereafter, I get a reply from the man himself. And it opens with, oh, yeah, that used to happen to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so... So here's where it gets crazy. He then says, what would you think if I returned to the comics page to draw your comic? And I think, this is Nick. It's not Bill. <laughs> so I write, Nick, if you think I'm dumb enough to fall for this, you got another thing coming. P.S., if this is really Bill Waters, then I will do anything you want, including setting my head on fire. And it's Watterson. And he says, here's what I need you to do. A couple of conditions. You can't reveal that it's me until it's over, number one. Number two, no matter who asks you for interviews, I don't give them. So I said, That's, I'll do all of that. 
So I, he said, just come up with a premise, how I enter the strip. So he says, um, he had some idea. Oh, yeah, I remember his idea. His idea was, I get hit on the head and suddenly know how to draw. <laughs> Very insulting. Uh, so I, I come up with a different one. And my different one was, there's a little girl named Libby who is called Lib, which backwards is Bill. Um, and she bothers me every day about how poorly I draw. And one day I get so frustrated, this is me in the strip, the character of me, that I say to her, okay, you have so many complaints, you draw it. So I hand her the pen, and everything you see from that moment forward is Bill. So it was crazy. And to top this off, he's in Washington, D.C. at this cartoonist's house, and he moves this trip so that we're there at the same moment. So I get to hang out with him. I tell you, nobody has met Watterson. And I am as nervous as when I met Sparky. And it was incredible. He was easy to make laugh. He was fun. We talked about everything. Um, and then when it was done, we took the three strips he had drawn uh, and we auctioned them for Parkinson's research. Those three strips together sold for $77,000. Um, yeah, which is crazy. Thank you. To, to which I emailed Bill and I said, don't get cocky, I'm at least $100 of that. So, um, yeah, so that's my water so story. So, I have one of the strips. Hi, hi Mr. Yeah. Passis, you're drawing a croc scene? Yes, Libby, I am. Let me guess, you can draw it better. Well, you know what? Here's my pen, Lib, knock yourself out. And then it gets good. You can see, it's changed. Uh, uh, stuff and tastes like good riddance. Now we've drawn good, this fun strip, funnier. Uh, I don't approve. First try. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. was... So, you know what's funny? You guys want to know something crazy? So remember he told me I couldn't reveal who it was? There were a million correct guesses that that was Bill Watterson. And do you know what the clue was? You want to put it back up? You guys want to guess what the clue was that that was Watterson's work? The feet, the shoes coming out of the mouth. He's the only guy who draws those shoes like that. So, yeah, he kind of gave it away. You know what's crazy? He sketched the characters to ask what I thought, and I was like, oh, whatever you do is fantastic. I never asked him for the sketches. So, man, I would have loved to have that. I'm too shy to ask him now, but, yeah, that was super cool. So I want to ask about the, the comic that you did that has the biggest response. Yes. And, and actually, I know what it is. Do you want me to show it first? Do you want to talk about it before I show it? Uh, why don't you show it first, and then I'll tell the story. Okay. Get ready for this one. This will shift the mood rapidly. Yes. We, we put our dog to sleep on Wednesday. She had cancer. Her name was Edie, and she was the only dog I've ever had. My wife Stacy and I would walk her every morning and stop at this little corner where little kids passed. Even kids that were afraid of dogs would pet her because Edie was so gentle and sweet. That was her superpower. Sometimes when I was drawing, she'd lie on the couch outside my studio door and protect me from squirrels. None ever got me. She also protected me from mallard duck. Uh, it was stuffed and not likely to do much, but Edie's heart was in the right place, which is why our heart hurt so much. So run, Edie, run to that beautiful field where you'll always receive the love and affection you grave. Now, this is Edie. I asked him to read that because I can never get through it. <laughs> uh, what it was was um, my dad was sick, so I went to Phoenix to see him. And that's the weekend we had to put E to sleep. So my way of coping was to write that. So I wrote that as it was happening. So It's, it's beautiful. And, and uh, the interesting thing for me is that Wiley, when he was here, has the biggest heart in the world for animals, too. And... and if you all were here, you remember it broke up Wiley when he talked about it too. So, so we all we all get it. By far the biggest response I've ever gotten to a strip. By yeah. far, it was yeah. overwhelming. Yeah. So wordplay. I, I have another strip. Yeah. Do, do you want to read, read it? Or it? Or am I, I, I read think it? I can read it. <laughs> Whose drummer was Keith Moon? Right. Whose? Yes. What's the name? Watts is the drummer for the Rolling Stone. I don't care about the Rolling Stones. Whose drummer is Keith Moon? You are correct there. Where? Where is the guitarist for the Grateful Dead? How is he relevant? How is the guitarist for a different band? Who? Yes. The who? No. Yes. 
Whose guitarist is Pete Townsend? I don't know. Third base. <laughs> when would you like the hit? Winwood is the guitarist for... I can't see it. Traffic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank so uh, did people like that? Yeah, that was huge. <laughs> Um, he'll show you the pun strip, but the hardest to write are those because um, if you do that Abbott and Costello, the conversation has to make sense for the goat all the way through and for rat all the way through. So it's a bit of a struggle, but it was, that got a gigantic response, so I loved it, yeah. All right, so let's move on to puns. Yes. Okay. Uh... Now I know before, he sh before we do this, <laughs> that half of you hate these. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Hey, Rat, who's your friend? He's the dawn of one of the local crime families, but don't bother him. He's messing with some flashlight. It's okay, I just put batteries in it. Why is it shaped like a woman? It's Elizabeth Hurley, that actress from Austin Powers. I think she's beautiful, so I had it specially made. Wow, that's really, pig, pig, I need your help. Hey, Ron Say, former third baseman for the L.A. Dodgers. What do you need? What does he say in the corner? I dropped my keys outside, but it's too dark to find them. Got a light I can borrow? Here, borrow mine. Thank you, sir. Be right back. Gosh, I hope it works. Not sure if those batteries were fresh. Oh, I should check. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's hurly light? <laughs> I'll let a professional hit you. All right. <laughs> What's funny is, like, I know it's dumb what he says, hey, Ron, say, third base, whatever. The dumber it is, the more I laugh. So <laughs> that just encourages me. Um, but I love doing the pun strips. It just makes me laugh. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to change it a little bit. We're going to come back to comics. But you, you, you wrote some books. Yes. Uh, but, and I want to talk about the Timmy Failure books. Uh, and what is... is do you write at the third grade level? Or? <laughs> I think, you know what it was? There was a book agent who was a fan of the strip, and he said, do you want to try doing a middle grade book? So I said, yeah, I'll try. So I had this idea of a little kid who's supposed to be a detective, like you heard in the video, like Encyclopedia Brown. But I wanted my kid to not be smart and to not be able to figure out anything. And so I wrote it, and it hit, and it got translated into a, a whole bunch of languages, and I got to tour everywhere. But the greatest part was that the director of this movie called Spotlight, which won Best Picture, um, and Win Win, and The Station Agent, he's done a whole bunch of movies, loved the book. And he wanted to turn it into a movie for Disney, until I threw a wrench into the whole process. And I said, now at the time, his name's Tom McCarthy. He's literally holding the Academy Award for Best Screenplay and Best Movie. And I say, hey, can I write it with you? And Tom says, he pauses for about four seconds, and he goes, what experience do you have writing movies? And I said, you know that Sid Field book on screenplays? I've read it twice. <laughs> and Tom goes, here's what we'll do. I'm going to write the first act. You write the first scene of the second act, and we'll see how it goes. And I did it, and he liked it. And we became best friends for two years, and we wrote that whole thing together. And sure enough, Disney made it into a movie. And when we shot it, Tom made sure to put money in the budget that I was there for the entire five months of filming, which is a crazy experience because Timmy, here's the where it got really surreal. Timmy opens with the little boy driving a Cadillac into a home. And I am in Vancouver, and I am standing there, and the people at Disney have built a home and there is a car coming at 40 miles an hour to crash into that home. And all I can think is, the only reason that's happening is because I had this dumb little idea in my head. And it was so intense and wonderful. And Wallace Shawn uh, played Timmy's teacher, and that was great. And Craig Alexander from The Office played his uh, counselor. Um, and it was fantastic. We filmed it, actually, kind of on either side of you. We filmed half of it in Vancouver and half of it in Portland. Um, and we uh, loved it. Um, so that was a great experience. <laughs> I loved it. It's, it's right here. If you need that. So, so uh, 
this goes back to me being younger, but it, now I do it every day. And, and I know the, the, the way to know someone has really become big time. And uh, you were just vindicated as big time. It's been recent. You like, just announced it here now? Yeah, I yeah I'll, I'll go ahead and announce it. Thank you very much. You were a Jeopardy question. Uh, so, look, this is what big time looks like, people. That was such a thrill. So if you're on Jeopardy, the way you find out about it is people on the East Coast tell you first. So I did this really cool thing. Uh, my son, Thomas, uh, he watches Jeopardy every night. So I didn't tell him. Uh, instead, uh, when I got home, we turned on Jeopardy, and he's watching, and I know it's coming. And sure enough, it comes. And rather than make a big deal, I just answer the question. I go, pearls before swine. <laughs> and, he, and he turns to me, he goes, did you know that was going to happen? I go, no, I didn't. No, no idea. And he was just stunned. So that was super fun. Um, what I did, I put Alex Trebek in a strip years ago, and um, they liked it. So they asked if they could have some of that. Uh, there were three strips, and so I sent them to them. And I've never been, but apparently if you go to a taping of Jeopardy in the hallway leading to the studio are my strips. So uh, they've always been super kind to me. But there's no bigger thrill than that. That was really exciting. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, I had a question from a friend that I want to... Uh, so last week, we, uh, two, a couple weeks ago, we had a, a, a great uh, uh, session in here, and one of our speakers was Monica Guzman. And she's fantastic. Was anybody here? It was, it was so good. And she's signing books afterwards, and somebody asked me, well, who's next? And I said, Stefan Passes. And she literally goes, the, the comic guy? And I said, yeah. And she goes, I love him. And then she starts telling me this story. And I'm like, w would you just send that to me? And so here it is. Hello, Spokane. This is uh, Monica from Seattle. I was there not that long ago, and I'm really excited you have Stefan uh, tonight. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there, because uh, big, big fans over here in this household. So Stefan, man, we connected on Twitter, because my son just loves his work. And there was a comic one day that he got all excited about, and I tweeted about it. And Stefan and I ended up direct messaging each other. And at one point, Stefan's like, hey, you, you know... I see that you've got a book you're putting out and I've got some advice about what it's like to go on book tours and I don't know, you got time for a call? And I was like, seriously? So I picked up the phone, we had a great conversation. He gave me really great advice and he's just a really, really nice guy. And then on top of everything else, he made this guy <laughs> super happy. Because <laughs> for his birthday, he sent him a signed drawing. Um, so this is Julian, my son Julian. He's 10, he has loads of Stefan Pastis books. In fact, you have one right there that you've been reading. No, <laughs> right Mom, there on I your finished bed. it, I, 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 keep, I just read it over and over. Okay, well, Julian here has a question for Stefan. Oh boy, well, hello 500 or so people or whatever that are seeing me. Yay. <laughs> uh, but uh, Stefan, um, if you could be any, any job in the world other than a cartoonist, what would it be? And there it is. Excited to hear your answer. Wait, are we That's good. It? Well, we later on. I think we'll hear it later on. <laughs> okay, we'll see. I'll let you know. Okay. I know what I would do. I am the world's uh, biggest uh, Anthony Bourdain fan. So at night when I go to sleep, I always watch a new episode of any one of his four shows. I would love to have traveled like that. Um, I love it. So I'm sort of doing it now. Uh, I travel quite a bit. And in the last year and a half, I've been trying to see all of this country. So I travel typically by myself, and I write about what I see every day. Um, and I'm going to turn it into a book, um, sort of like a book of David Sedaris essays, but all about travel and tell the, the crazy things that have happened. I'll tell you one story. You want one from the book? I'll preview the book. This is a Nutter's one. So I'm in Key West, Florida, and I'm there to write one of the Timmy books, which is set in Key West. So I was researching. <laughs> and there's a little corner bookshop in Key West. And I've just figured, I just finished working out at this gym and I'm all sweaty and it looked air conditioning, <laughs> air conditioned. So I said, I'll go. So I walk in and then I do this thing. It's so obnoxious. I do it in every bookstore. I walk up to the person that's behind the desk and I say, um, 
hey, do you have any Timmy Failure books or Pearl's books? And the woman says, well, we can look. And so she takes me to the children's section, and they didn't have any. And she said, I can order them for you. And I go, oh, that's OK. I just, I'm the author. And uh, <laughs> so she goes, uh, oh, I write books too. Now, let me just tell you what my experience has been with that. Uh, a lot of people tell you that, and you want to be nice. And, uh, but I know what's coming next. What they always say next is, do you have a book agent? And I say, yes. And they say, can you put me in touch with your book agent? I have done that so many times that my book agent has asked me to please stop sending people to them. Um, so I know it's coming, but she doesn't ask anything. And I'm like, oh, that's really nice. And so I thank her, and she tells me her name, and it's great. And I walk out. When I walk out the store, I'm about a block away. I'm so clueless. The name she just told me. I know that name. That was Judy Bloom. <laughs> I had just about patted her on the head and told her, good luck with your writing. So I ran back to the store. I apologized. I said, is there any way you could take a picture with me? And she said, she was super nice. So we took the picture. So you'll see that in the book. So crazy. I love that. So I, I want to ask, uh, uh, have you always had trouble pronouncing words? Is this yeah. just, just words related okay, so to here, our Okay, so here's the thing. When I told people I was coming here, I, had, I said it right. I said, I'm going to Spokane. And they said, I don't think that's how they say it. <laughs> they say Spokane. And I said, I don't think that's right. So I talked to Rob and realized I was right all along. Um, what I have said wrong all these years, until Rob taught me, I've always said Gonzaga. Because that sounds like the Spanish. I, no, I don't, don't, you don't have to boo again. I'm doing the best I can. So, so he told me it's uh, Gonzaga. So it was cool. He, share, he shared with me a text from, was it the president of the university? Yep, I sent it to him before we published it. And, and literally, the president of Gonzaga, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I'm like, right? And he goes, can I meet him? And I'm like, yes! And then I forgot to take you. Oh. Yeah, sorry. We had a busy day. We had a busy day. You Got know who was the, Stacy, my wife, rarely impressed by anything I do. Uh, super impressed by the fact that the president of Gonzaga University texted that. Because every year when she does her bracket, she takes Gonzaga the entire way. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, funny, funny thing. Thane sent me a note and said, can you please have uh, Stefan autograph this? Because I would like to send it to somebody, and I'm not making you up, making this up. Who did he want you to, to autograph it to? Do you remember? Uh, no, wait, wait, who? who? Uh, Jimmy Kimmel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was really cool. Jimmy it, it, Kimmel was actually, he told me the story with him and Gonzaga. I didn't know that. But he was a big, he wanted to be a cartoonist. So he, he invited me and some other cartoonists to go to the studio, and we met him, an incredibly nice, generous person, just like he is on the air. Super nice, yeah. We don't like him. So, All right. Um, uh, so, 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 I'm sorry, I, I forgot that, I forgot about this. Uh, you have a book. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry. So, so how many uh, of these compilations have you done? And, and tell me oh. what the process is like. There have been, I think, now 14 of those treasuries. We always have fun with the cover. Um, that's a photo that was taken in Eastern California. I was not actually climbing the mountain. I am climbing a ladder somewhere else. Um, but I loved it, and I wanted to do something with Wise Ass, because uh, he had become so popular. And I love the complaint of someone complaining about wise ass. I like doing things where the editor is like, well, you can't say ass, can you? And well, you can if it's a donkey, like he's allowed to do it. So I like, I like being on that edge the whole time. So being able to say wise ass is really uh, liberating for me. Um, so anyways, we did that. But the popular part about these things, I don't know if it's a compliment or not, when anybody sees it, they love the commentary more than the strips. 
So thank you. <laughs> so I write under every strip, and I tell you if it's a good strip or a bad strip or what I was thinking about in the day. So um, yeah, it's fun. It's super fun for me to do. Most guys who do these books just reprint the strip. But for me, it's fun to comment on the strip. It gets a little more meta that way, and you're in on it with me. So yeah, that's super fun. And I always, if you're bored, yeah, I did it with this one. I um, always hide my two kids' names on the front cover. So Tom and Julia, but you really got to look for them, are both on the front. So if you're bored when you're waiting in line tonight, <laughs> look for the names. So uh, in our editor's meeting, we've never bitched about ass once. No, no. <laughs> when we're, we're near Idaho. So we, we, we'll go further. So, 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 so I got to ask, what, what, what's next? Are you working on, on anything else? Yeah, so now it's all about that travel book. So tomorrow... I take off, I go to Coeur d'Alene, uh, right, Coeur d'Alene. It's in Idaho. Yep, then I know, sorry about that. <laughs> then some cities in Montana, I go to Missoula, I go to Butte, I go to Helena, then I drive uh, back. So, oh, and I go to Glacier National. Yeah, boy, do they make it hard to get into that park. So I gotta reserve it tomorrow at 8 a.m. or something. But um, I love doing it. I love seeing the country. It's great, and I want to write about it. So hopefully that all um, uh, comes together. You know what's funny? I'll tell you a story. I meant to say it earlier. Sorry, this is totally out of sequence. When you showed Monica's clip, remember how, how excited the little boy was? That is the great superpower you have as a cartoonist, kind of what Sparky did for me. So I'll tell you a cool story. Uh, just something I'm able to do. We had a huge fire in Santa Rosa, right? Destroyed almost half the town. And we were very close. Uh, but anyways, when it was over, this woman wrote to me, and she didn't really ask for anything. She said, my nephew, huge fan, uh, house burned down in the fire, lost all your books, can't rebuy them because the early ones are out of print. And she said, but just want to tell you how much you've meant to him. So I go, can you get him to the Starbucks on Mission Avenue at noon? And she goes, yeah. And I go, okay, don't tell him why he's going there. Just have him and his parents go. So they do it. And the parents are there, and they're with the kid. And I walk in with all the books. He almost cries. He's so excited. It's such a simple gesture by me, but when it's what Sparky was for me. Like when you're a cartoonist, you have that uh, ability. I mean, I did this because of Schultz. So the fact that I can do it for someone else is... Um, Super, super cool. Can I say one last thing about Schultz? This always amazes me. This has nothing to do with me, but I love this fact. Schultz, named Charles, when he's a little baby, gets named Spark, Sparkplug after a character in a comic strip. I think it was Barney Google. He gets the greatest cartoonist of all time gets named a comic strip character when he's born, so much so that no one ever called him Charlie or Charles. So if someone saw him and said, Charles, he didn't even turn around. His name was Sparky from birth. So that's weird fact number one. Cartoonist named after a character. But here's the crazy one. In the 1960s, Sparky was going through a divorce with his wife. And he had this crazy period where he would go down from Santa Rosa and go to these hippie parties in San Francisco. Now, this is straight-laced Sparky. You've probably seen pictures of him. Crew cut from the Midwest, very conservative. And he goes to these parties, and they all get stoned, except for Sparky. Sparky didn't drink, didn't do anything. And they have this thing where they go around the room, and they say to each person in the room, hey, man, if you could be something, you know, other than what you are now, what would you be? And you're just supposed to say something far out, right? Everyone gives their answer, and it comes to Sparky. And they say, if you weren't doing what you do now, what would you be? And Sparky goes, I'd be dead. Brings the whole room down. <laughs> but he's telling you, I live for this strip. Okay, fast forward 30 years. Sparky has cancer. Uh, this is when I meet him. I had this a whole other story for the second time towards the end of his life. But um, on the night the last strip is running, in February of 2000, literally, as the presses in the middle of the night are rolling, carrying the last peanut strip, Sparky dies. If you put that in a movie, they'd make you take it out of the movie. 
because it's the coincidence is so wild. It's crazy. So I'm fascinated by his life and how he lived for that strip. So that has always been my North Pole. When I'm stuck for ideas, his grave is near where I live. So I go and I sit there on the little bench and I just become calm. It's great. So, so I, I want us to, to go to the, the audience for questions first, but it, we need to get the lights turned on and everything. So, sure. so, so as we're getting ready for that, we'll be able to come to you or if, if, it's, if you can do it, it would be easier if you came to these open seats over here. Uh, but if you can't, Christy's super cagey. So, 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 uh, let's, uh, I, I want to know your impressions of, of Spokane. Oh, I love uh, it. So, yeah, why you've been here a couple days. Yeah. No, no, so I got the whole tour last night. Rob took me everywhere. Let me tell you something that Rob will not say about himself. I have done so many events uh, with newspaper editors. I could list the papers, but they're all the ones you've heard of, from the Washington Post to Dallas to Denver. Um, you literally have the best newspaper editor in the United States. <laughs> and what's, you know, I've told him this, his one failing in life is that he's only one person because I would clone him and put him in every city. Not only does he do great things for newspapers, he does great things for communities. He's such a revolutionary in that way, and I have never met anybody like him. So you guys are really lucky. All right, I think we, coincidentally, we have a first question from somebody <laughs> seated here. Fantastic. Stan, please. Name? Hi, my name is Angela Gaddis. Um, I teach kindergarten over in Hilliard. So if you don't know Hilliard, we are the second highest or second lowest poverty in the state, okay? So... Does that um, mean rich or poor? What side of... You mean you're saying... We beat out Tacoma. Gotcha, okay. Okay, okay. So, um, so we hear children who say wise ass because that's their first language, right? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so um, they see cars go through the door, right? Yeah. Okay, um, there's characters galore. I promise you, okay? Okay. Um, this is an opportunity for you to make amends to Judy Bloom. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even joking. You cannot make this shit up. You cannot yeah. oh. make these things up. <laughs> Gonze Gonze Gonzaga is our campus kids partner. And yesterday on our writing sample, yeah. at the bottom of the writing, there was a little arrow on the back. It was rat. Ah, oh, really? I, did I mention I teach kindergarten? kindergarten yeah. Five years old. That's that was rat. Cool. You can't make this up. I so, love that. If you want to come do some inspiration on your way to Coeur d'Alene, <laughs> like 8:30 to 9:30 a.m., there if are I some could, kids would. who would benefit to know, like, what their possibilities are. Oh, well, thank you. If Ms. I Gattis, could, do you, I, kindergarten. I would. Do you have a picture? Do you have a picture with you? I got tons. Okay, cool. <laughs> I love that. That's the best part. Kids are the best. When I did the Timmy books, I spoke at schools everywhere, and I loved it. There's a part of... So when they're in high school, I sort of lose them. But when they're little, when I draw Rat or Pig or the Timmy characters, it's like I'm doing magic. And that interaction with them just is uh, wonderful. I absolutely uh, love it and live for it. So did you ask me to come to your school? Was that the end of it? I think she did. <laughs> I would. That was definitely... I leave, I leave tomorrow at 7, but if I could, yeah. I would. I could draw you something tonight that you could give to them. Yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> sure. Is there anybody over in this section for a question? There's one in the back here. Oh, come on up. Come on down. Can we... <laughs> oh, was good. Yeah, can we turn the house lights Just... up more? And, and this is the rat that was drawn yeah. for me by <laughs> Kenny <Yeah>. Gardner <laughs> to earlier today. Go right ahead. Hey, Stefan. How are you? Uh, huge honor to be talking to you. You're an incredible inspiration. Oh, thank you. Um, it's the last thing I read in the paper every day because you save the best for last. Thank you. Um, one thing before I get to my question, I want to say your strip about Edie was huge. I don't remember if you remember, but uh, you did one on the anniversary of Sandy Hook. Yeah. That yeah. just left me stunned. I mean, I, I put I, their I, names in the stars. You did with, with uh, Rat and Pig, I believe, just sitting there looking at them. Just a single panel. Yeah. Incredibly emotional. Thank and, you. Uh, it was just their names, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, Thank uh, you. I got a bunch of your strips up in my office, and my boss doesn't like them, but 
too bad. Thank you. Um, anyway, my, <laughs> my question is, you've got a ton of great characters, right? Rat Pig, yeah. um, go Guard Duck, love Guard Duck. Um, which one do you identify most with? Rap, for sure. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm proud to say myself. So. On a good day, I'm pig, but I'm mostly rat. Um, you know what's fun, uh, crazy? Um, I was speaking in Connecticut, and sometimes if you're doing a tour and you're in a different city every night, you almost forget where you are if you go to enough towns. Um, but somebody brought up that strip, and as they were asking, I realized I was where it happened. And it moved the room. Like that strip, I could tell. Like that moved the room. And that's the power you have. Like if, I, if I'm a smart ass every day, on the days I get serious, like that strip or the Edie strip, um, it really hits you because you don't see it coming. Um, if you do that sparingly, it has a power. And I love doing that uh, when I can. So yeah, that's cool. Thank you. Stefan, right here. Yes. Oh, hello. My name is Max. I have a question. Yes. Why do you use animals in your cartoon? I will tell you. So there's a comic strip called Baby Blues. Do you guys know Baby Blues? I think so. So a good friend of mine, the creator and I, went on all the USO trips together to Iraq and Afghanistan. Very good guy named Rick Kirkman. And when Rick draws the little kids, the three little kids, and they're in the back seat of the car, maybe when the car's parked, or anything that could potentially be harmful to the kids, he hears from people everywhere. People that are saying, how dare you do that with kids? You would think these were real kids, because he's shown me the emails. I could hit rat with a baseball bat, and no one cares. <laughs> <laughs> so if it's a talking animal, you're great. Nobody complains. So. I, that's why I love to do it. You can get away with murder when you do animals. <laughs> Would you care if he got hit with a baseball bat? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's makes it so question. funny. When, you know, I, I could go on about this all day, but there are a lot of humorless people in the world. Yeah. Uh, number one on that list are cyclists. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, they get, they get pretty mad. But, but, th but this is the thing, this is the analogy I always use. When you get really mad at a comic strip, I'm sort of like a clown. And if you get really mad at me, it's sort of like if you got in a fight with a clown in your front yard. <laughs> Either you beat the clown up and all your neighbors go, you're punching a clown or the clown beats you up, and they go, you got beat up by a clown. <laughs> so I have that advantage. I can hit and move and make fun of you and do whatever I want. So um, I should probably tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you one story. Do you want to know the biggest uh, trouble I ever got in? It's even bigger than the cyclist. Uh, dumb strip, it was about a llama, it was a diplomat. And you know how diplomats have to be very even keeled. And I made them a llama, because when llamas get upset, of course, they spit on people. <laughs> so they're the last animal that should ever be a diplomat. That was fine. What was not fine was I wanted to name him something a little foreign sounding. So I named him Ataturk. Ataturk, if you don't know, <laughs> which I know now, <laughs> is the, basically the founder of modern Turkey. And if you're Turkish, he's sort of a combination of George Washington and Jesus. <laughs> if you make fun of him while you are standing on Turkish soil, it is a 13-year prison sentence. <laughs> I don't think anything of it. I get a bunch of complaints in the morning, more than normal. And one of them says, uh, I say to the guy, look, I didn't mean to make fun of him. It just sounded a little foreign sounding, and also a kind of funny, at a Turk, at a boy. I just like the sound of it. I think I even called him, I said dude in the email. So I looked as cavalier as you can look. That person that wrote was a stealth reporter for the largest Turkish American newspaper in the United States. And that cavalier quote, dude, I just thought the name sounded funny, went right in the article. And what was a minor firestorm became a major firestorm. 
So this was thousands of thousands of emails. They would come while I was asleep, each more violent than the last. Stacy and the kids left home. Oddly, they left me there. <laughs> And here comes the Turkish ambassador to the United States of America. Slow day at the embassy. Uh, wants an apology from me, the syndicate, and every paper that I ran in. So all the lawyers from Scripps have to get involved. Huge conference call. I'm on the phone in California. And we proceed to craft what I would call a non-apology apology, i.e. the kind I give to Stacy. Um, <laughs> I know, you, I know everyone does this. You all say, uh, I I'm so sorry you felt that way. <laughs> Which is really saying the problem is all you. <laughs> so anyways, this is the most serious thing I've ever been involved in. You got to do the apology. The board of scripts is involved. This is bad. So we're doing the thing. They go through every word. And then when the call is almost over, I say, hey, guys, uh, do you mind if I add a PS? Now, there's no laughter on the other end of the phone. And let me just say right now, a huge part of this was I'm Greek, and Turks and Greeks don't get along. I think that fed a lot of this. So I say, Stefan, what is the PS? And I go, uh, PS, please give Cyprus back. <laughs> Nobody, Nobody laughed. Nobody laughed. There were no laughs. So the legacy is, as much as I travel the world, I have never gone to Turkey. <laughs> All right, one right here. Oh, hi, my name is Valerie, and I'm wondering if we could have the name of your agent? Where, where oh. <laughs> I should give out his name just to make his email light up. <laughs> no, I have a really good agent. He did all the Timmy books. He's great. He's in New York, but I cannot give you his name. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've got a problem. Uh, a month ago, you ran a comic where you put in 19 names of state capitals. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have either found 17 or 22. Is there some place where I can find the two I'm missing? I know one of them because everyone asks the same question. One is Raleigh, North Carolina. It's the word really in the strip. So I sort of cheated that one. I don't know what the last one is, but I should put them all, I should have posted them somewhere. Yeah, that got a big response. Did you, were you guys able to do that, most of you? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> sorry. I apologize. I should come with an answer code. Yeah. Okay. Raleigh is probably one of them. Yeah. yeah. It is. Uh, Good. Okay. A friend also who uh, couldn't make it tonight asked, uh, what, is, or what are the pearls and who are the pigs? Yeah, so the strip, the strip obviously that comes from the Bible, don't cast your pearls before swine. But for me, it was rat thinks he's filled with pearls of wisdom and it's wasted on the pig, the swine. So that's where I came up with it. Yeah. I, I didn't know it at the time, but my favorite author, Kurt Vonnegut, it is the subtitle of God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So you said your uh, first character was Rat, mm -hmm. and uh, you were a lawyer. I'm just wondering if there was any connection. <laughs> Say that again. You're wondering what? what? Was there any connection? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I just, yeah. I, you know what I like? I like animals that are despised, like you dirty rat or you filthy pig. Or I liked having characters that were lowly. And maybe because I hung out with lawyers all the time, that's where I got it from. But yeah, I, can I just say, I, I always I feel bad because I know there's lawyers in here. I never enjoyed it uh, at all. So I had to get out. People say sometimes like it was courageous. It wasn't courageous. It was desperate. I mean, I, I, I had to do something else. I had a day. I had a day at work. That was so bad, I came home, I had my suit on, I walked up the driveway, I'll never forget this, and I laid down on the concrete in my suit, like just a, a total breakdown, like I cannot do this anymore. So when the strip hit and it made it, I appreciate it like nobody else, because most cartoonists only do that. 
and they complain about those deadlines. But I had real deadlines. Like, you get sued if you don't meet them. And I had that real pressure. Everything I've done since then has been gravy. I mean, I look forward to Mondays. I used to dread Mondays. I know how lucky I am. So um, I will always be grateful for that. So thank you. So there, if you didn't know, the, 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 Trevor was the, Monica's son. The, yes. the, the, I think there were almost 550 people here tonight. And, <laughs> and uh, how many normally come? Like eight? Oh. <laughs> No, this is great. It's amazing. Thank you guys for coming. It's, I mean, it's so, it's so wonderful. I, I, let me, I'll answer one more because I know some of you have this question, so I just go ahead and answer it. Uh, especially in the early days, I spent a lot of my time uh, uh, making fun of the other comics, uh, particularly one comic, <laughs> uh, Family Circus. Um, so I did a week of strips one time that I like to refer to as the week my career almost ended abruptly. <laughs> where I, it was when we were all looking for Osama bin Laden. And my premise was the family circus family is so out of touch that he could hide right in their home and they wouldn't know who he was. <laughs> so you uh, might have that strip. So anyways, I put, I put Osama bin Laden in the family circus. People go loopy, uh, not in a good way. <laughs> Except for Bill Keen, the creator of the strip. Bill loved it so much that he asked for the original. So when I got to visit him in his home in Phoenix, um, he showed it to me right there on the wall. So super good sense of humor. Um, when Bill passed away, his son Jeff took over the strip. And Jeff and I, we went to Iraq together. We went to Afghanistan together. I know Jeff super well. The truth is, they have a great sense of humor. So as mad as people get for me making fun of Family Circus, the Family Circus guys do not get mad. <laughs> but but here's, here's the thing, here's the thing. So some of you may have heard this story, but I had to speak in front of an auditorium like this at Comic-Con in San Diego. Jeff Keen, the creator, was there. So I said to Jeff, I said, I almost invariably get asked what you guys think of when I make fun of you. And I go, can I just tell them we're great friends? And maybe if you're there, I'll introduce you. And Jeff says, yeah, that's great. I'll do it. That's a great plan. So I give the talk. And when the talk is over, like I had planted the guy in the audience, the very first question was, what do the creators of other strips think when you make fun of them, particularly the family circus guys? So I'm like, oh my god, this is perfect. So I tell them what I told you, what great sports they are, the whole thing. And then I have my bonus surprise. I say, and? Uh, the creator of Family Circus, I think, is somewhere here today. Jeff, could you stand up? So I look, and in the very back row is Jeff, and he stands up. And all I hear across the audience from Jeff is, Screw you, Pastis! <laughs> so... I, I got to tell you all, so I reached out to, to some other cartoonists, and I was going to include their questions, and they were all great sports, but I didn't have Jeff's contact information, so I asked Steph if he would reach out to him, and his response was so awesome, he screenshot it and sent it to me. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Pastis, this is Mr. King's secretary. He it says he's aware of you, and therefore it would be all right for you to give Mr. Keene's info to help you provide some higher profile talent to your quote unquote <laughs> speaking engagement. He wishes you had informed him when this quote unquote speech is being done uh, and when you would have need this since Mr. Keene is very busy, but he understands you are very new to this business uh, and obviously your nerves got the better of you. Uh, and then I have his contact information. I'm gonna send it to y'all. <laughs> So, so, I love that. So, I, I have one more question, and so he, you should, he's going to sign for everybody. So, we're going to have so much fun tonight, but my, my question is, have you picked the bathroom where you're going to put Rad on? Oh, so, yeah. Here in Spokane. What, what was the bar I told you? Baby was in the Baby title. Baby bar. He wants to go, so. Yeah. Uh, so, I draw on a one bathroom wall everywhere I go, sometimes with the permission of the owner, uh, usually not. But um, the last one was, the, was so cool. It's a bar called the Whitewater Tavern in Little Rock, Arkansas. Super famous in Little Rock. And I drew rat on the wall. And I didn't know if they'd get mad or what. 
and somebody um, texted me a photo of the wall. They had taken plexiglass and protected the drawing, <laughs> which was so cool. So yeah, I love it. I do that wherever I go. So I'll try to do that in this bar and hopefully not get arrested in Spokane. <laughs> so that would be great. So, so we, uh, we wanted to give you a little gift. Oh, thank you. So, so uh, one of the things that, 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 that we're, we're, we're very proud of here is that our baseball team's jersey is done in Salish. Oh, yeah. And it's the only minor league jersey in Cooperstown. No way. Oh, no way. Thank the you. The Indians sent one over to you oh, for today. Thank you. That's so cool. That's so cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. So, everybody, let's give him it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no one leave. We got to get a quick picture. Can, can you scoot in? Oh, we're going to do the picture. <laughs> All right, here we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>